the founder of demonic cultivation, an English translation by Fan E E thirty three, read by Luna Minerva. Chapter five. Pride, part one. Only a few days passed before Wei Wuxian realized that he may have made a mistake. The donkey he had stolen was way too hard to please. It was only a donkey, but it refused to eat anything other than fresh, tender grass with dew drops hanging from the leaves, and shunned any blades which showed the slightest hint of yellow. When they passed by a farmhouse, Wei Wuxian stole a few stalks of wheat to feed it, but it only chewed a couple of times before Tch! it launched them back out, its spit louder and more resonant than any human's. Not only would it barely eat, it also refused to move, and if Wei Wuxian tried to make it, it would throw a fit, jumping and kicking at him with its hind legs. His life suffered several close calls. What's more, its braying was agony to the ear. It had no redeeming qualities as either a mount or a pet. Wei Wuxian couldn't help but think fondly of his sword. It was most likely hanging on the wall of some grand clan now, exhibited by the chief as a trophy of war. Dragging the donkey with him come life or death, he ran a few lengths of road toward a large field belonging to some nearby village. The glaring sun beat down from above, and he sought shelter under a big scholar tree on the embankment between the rice paddies. The thick shade beneath the verdant leaves was dark and cool, and there was an old well where the villagers had placed a bucket and a ladle so that passers-by could quench their thirst. Once the donkey had run here, it absolutely refused to budge. Thus, Wei Wuxian jumped off, slapped its venerable hindquarters, and said, you sure must be a magnificent, prosperous being. You're even fuzzier than me. The donkey sneezed at him. While Wei Wuxian passed the time a hundred different ways, a group of people trekked in his direction along the criss-crossing paths in the distance. They wore bamboo baskets on their backs, linen shirts and straw shoes. They had the rustic, earthy appearance of rural villagers from head to toe. Among them was an almost delicate and pretty young woman with a round face, who had perhaps walked under the harsh sun for too long and wanted to sit in the shade and drink some water. But when she saw the donkey tied to the tree, braying and stomping discontently, and the wild-haired lunatic with red and white pigment smeared all over his face sitting next to it, she became frightened and wouldn't approach. Wei Wuxian had always considered himself protective and caring of women, so seeing her state, he moved to create space for her and went to bother the donkey. Only once the travelers saw he was harmless did they relax and come near. Each and every one of their faces were bright red and drenched in sweat, some fanning themselves, and some fetching themselves water. The young woman sat by the well and, seemingly knowing Wei Wuxian had intentionally made room for her, gave him a tiny smile. Among the group was a man holding a compass, who gazed out into the distance. He then looked back down, bewildered. We're almost at the foot of Dafan Mountain. Why isn't the needle moving? The compass he was using was no ordinary compass. Its markings were different, and its needle didn't point north. It wasn't a compass of the cardinal directions, but an evil wind compass, used to locate fierce, malignant spirits. Wei Wuxian knew then the people he had met were a family of poor, unaffiliated cultivators. Outside of the illustrious, moneyed houses of cultivation, who spent their spare time contemplating the poetry of white snows and sunny spring days, there were also quite a few of these kinds of small, unrefined, closed-off and self-taught families. Perhaps they had rushed from the village to beg for shelter from a big clan that they had some relation to, or perhaps they were out on a night hunt. The middle-aged leader waved everyone toward the well for water and simultaneously said, Your compass is probably broken. Once we get back, I'll get you a new one. We're less than five kilometers from Dafan Mountain, so we can't rest for long. We've suffered the winds and the dust the whole journey. If you relax here, the people behind will pass us and all our efforts will be wasted. Indeed, they had come to night hunt. Many cultivators, fond of literary pursuits, called roaming the four corners of the land, exercising evil spirits, roving hunts. And since their prey typically came out at night, 
the Huns also became known as Night Huns. Though there were many cultivation clans, only a few became truly famous. If their ancestors had not accumulated prestige and prosperity, ordinary clans could only earn respect and reputation through their own achievements and climb the hierarchy of the cultivation world by their own sweat. Only by seizing a brutal monster or calamity-bringing spirit would their name start to have weight. Seizing evil things was what Wei Wuxian was best at, but the few days he'd been running around on the road breaking into graves, he had found only minor ghosts. He still lacked a ghost that could help him trample his opponents, so he decided he would also go to Dafan Mountain and try his luck. If he found a useful one, he would catch and deploy it. The cultivators had now rested enough and were preparing to take off. Before they left, the round-faced young woman took a half-green, half-red apple from the basket on her back and passed it to Wei Wuxian. This is for you. Wei Wuxian reached out to receive it with a big smile on his face, but the donkey raised its head, bared its teeth, and bit at the pro-offered fruit. He hastily grabbed hold of it, but when good fortune came, so did clever ideas. Seeing the donkey endlessly salivating over the little apple, Wei Wuxian picked up a tree branch and a fishing line, tied the apple to the branch, and hung the apple in front of the donkey's head. The donkey smelled the fragrant scent of the apple, and lusting after its sweet flesh, chased the fruit that was always just a little out of reach. Head raised and charging ahead, the animal ran faster than any colt Wei Wuxian had ever seen, leaving clouds of dust trailing behind it. The donkey didn't stop running, and thus they made it to Dafan Mountain before nightfall. Wei Wuxian only figured out how to write the mountain's name when he reached its base. From far away, it looked exactly like a venerable, open-hearted, squat Buddha. Thus it was Dafan Mountain, and the small village at the foot of the mountain was therefore called Fo Jiao Village. The number of cultivators who had gathered far exceeded Wei Wuxian's expectations. It was a mixed crowd, like a lake where both dragons and schools of tiny fish swam. The cultivators wore a dizzying, blinding array of colors and resembled a parade of restless flowers as they walked up and down the street. But for some unknown reason, everyone had a nervous expression on their face. They couldn't even spare the attention to laugh at Wei Wuxian's ridiculous face. In the center of the main road, a crowd of cultivators gathered, speaking solemnly. They seemed to be arguing and spoke loudly enough for Wei Wuxian to hear them from a distance. At first, the discussion was calm, but it grew more and more agitated as it progressed. I don't think this place ever had any soul-eating beasts or ghasts in the first place. That's obviously why no one's compass needle has moved. But if there really is nothing, how could seven of those villagers have lost their souls? They couldn't have all come down with the same bizarre disease, could they? I've never heard of such a disease. Just because the compasses aren't pointing to anything, does that necessarily mean nothing's here? They can only point in a general direction. They're not that accurate, so they can't be completely trusted. It's possible there's something around here that can interfere with the needle. Don't you remember who invented these compasses? I've never heard of anything disturbing the direction the needle points. What exactly do you mean by that? Why are you asking such weird questions? Of course I remember evil wind compasses were invented by Wei Ying. But just because he invented something doesn't mean it's all beautiful and perfect. Aren't people allowed to question him? I didn't say you weren't allowed to question him, or that his things were perfect. There's no need to spew mud everywhere, your highness! They began to argue in a different direction, and Wei Wuxian rode his donkey past them, laughing merrily. Even though so many years had passed, his ability to whip cultivators into verbal duels and tongue clashes had not diminished. Once you hear the name Wei, you're forced to fight, so the saying went. If there was a vote on who possessed the most extensive and long-lived fame among all cultivators, who could win against him? In all fairness, the cultivator who had questioned him wasn't wrong. The evil wind compasses in use were only the first edition, and indeed left something to be desired when it came to accuracy. Originally, Wei Wuxian had worked to improve them, but who told people to destroy his home before he was done? So he had no option but to inconvenience everyone and continue to force the inaccurate first edition compass on them. In any case, most things that eat flesh and chew bone were low level, such as walking corpses. Only refined, elegant, high-level beasts and vicious ghosts could eat and digest souls. To consume seven in one go, 
No wonder there were so many clans gathered here. This prey was no small matter. It was only natural that the compasses made a few errors. Holding the reins tightly away, Wuxian leapt from the donkey's back, grabbed the apple and held it in front of the donkey. One bite, just one bite. Hey, you almost bit off my hand. He took two bites off the other side of the apple and shoved it back into the donkey's mouth. While he reflected on how he had been reduced to sharing an apple with a donkey, someone collided with him from behind. He turned and saw a young woman who, even though she had walked straight into him, seemed to find him beneath her notice. Her eyes were dull and lifeless, her lips were molded into a slight smile, and she refused to tear her gaze away from a certain direction. Wei Wuxian followed her line of sight into the distance, where a solemn black mountain top lay, Dafan Mountain. Suddenly, without warning, the young woman began dancing. The dance was wild and violent, as though channeling a beast bearing its fangs and brandishing its claws. Wei Wuxian watched the young woman with bright interest, but another woman lifted her skirt and ran towards them, threw her arms around the dancing girl and cried, Ah Yen, let's go home! Let's go home! With all her strength, Ah Yen threw the woman off and continued, smile still plastered on her face, as though animated by some kind of hair-rising obsession. The older woman had no option but to chase the girl all over the street, wailing, tears dripping down her face. To the side, a street peddler said, Hell's bells! Blacksmith Zhang's Ah Yen's run out again. I feel sorry for her mother. Ah Yen, Ah Yen's husband and her own husband, not a single one's in good shape. Wei Wuxian strolled around the village, eavesdropping, collecting bits and pieces of idle chatter from the people he walked by, and pieced together the strange sequence of events that had unfolded. On Da Fan Mountain there was an old graveyard housing the people of Fo Jiao's village's ancestral graves, where the villagers would also bury and raise grave markers for unnamed corpses on occasion. One evening several months ago, when thunder rolled and the sky flashed with lightning, the wind and the rain pounded down upon the area, scoring the mountain the entire night. A patch of earth atop Da Fan Mountain collapsed, triggering a landslide, this patch of earth happened to be the exact patch on which the graveyard was located. Thus, many old graves were destroyed and others were exposed to the elements. Lightning struck, blasting and blackening both the coffins and the bodies inside. After this episode, the people of Fo Jiao village became extremely uneasy, prayed for blessings and then rebuilt the old burial mound, believing that this would settle the matter. But who knew from that point onwards, Fo Jiao village would suffer so many cases of lost souls. The first victim was a lazy bum who was poor as a rat and spent most of his days loafing about. Because he enjoyed going up the mountain and catching birds to pass time, he just so happened to be stuck on Da Fan Mountain the night of the landslide. Though scared half to death, he was blessed with good fortune. Nothing happened to him, at least on that night. But strange things began to occur only a few days after he returned. He suddenly found a wife, and was married with much fanfare, sparing no waving banners or beating drums, claiming he would live a life of merit and virtue, and pass his days with this promise in mind. The night of the wedding he drank himself blind, fell into bed and didn't get up. When his new wife called his name, he didn't react and only when she pushed him over did she discover that her groom's eyes were blank and lifeless and his body was as cold as ice. Aside from the fact that he was still breathing, there was little that distinguished him from a corpse. He ate nothing, drank nothing, and continued on in this state for many days before finally being peacefully buried. The poor bride became a widow, despite barely having been married. The second was Ai Yen from the family of blacksmith Zhang, the young woman had just been betrothed, but only a day after, her fiancé was bitten to death by wolves while hunting on the mountain. After she found out, the same fate befell her as befell the lazy bum. Happily, however, her disease somehow cured itself after a period of time, yet from that point onward she began to suffer from lunacy. She went outside every day to dance for people, smiling the entire time. The third was Ah Yen's father, blacksmith Zhang. To date, there had been seven victims in total. Wei Wuxian mulled over the matter and determined it was most likely the work of a soul-eating ghast, 
rather than a soul-eating beast. Though the difference between their names was only one word, they were entirely disparate beings. Cats were a type of ghost, but soul-eating beasts were a type of fae. According to Wei Wuxian, the sequence of events was most likely this. The landslide demolished old graves and lightning split open coffins, releasing a long dormant gas from among the bodies. If this was the case, the state of the coffins and presence of any seal traces upon them should suffice for confirmation. But the four Jiao villagers must have already long reburied the burnt coffins elsewhere and reinterred the bodies. There would be very few vestiges of the gas resting place. In order to climb the mountain, Wei Wuxian took the sloping road from the village. He hopped on his donkey and slowly ascended. After traveling a while, he encountered some people wearing dark expressions climbing down. These people had cuts and scrapes on their faces and seemed to be talking to each other all at once. The sky was dusky, and they all jumped in fright as they ran face to face into someone made up like a hanged ghost riding atop a donkey. They shouted angry words at him, circled around and continued down the slope at rapid clip. Looking back on them, Wei Wuxian wondered whether they had been defeated by their intended prey and were now returning from their night hunt empty-handed. He pondered a little more, slapped his donkey's hindquarters, and the two clambered up briskly. He had left at the perfectly wrong time and missed the group scrumbling. I've never met anyone so unreasonable. He's the head of such a big clan. What does he have to come here and compete with us for a single soul-eating ghast? He must have killed plenty when he was young. But what can we do? We can hardly do anything about him being a sect chief. Whichever house you offend, you must not offend the Jiang clan. Whoever you offend, you must not offend Jiang Chong. There's nothing to do except pack our bags, accept our fate, and go.